Good. Okay. Well, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our speaker tonight, Vivek Shandas. Professor uh, Shandas specializes in developing strategies for addressing the implications of climate change on cities. His teaching and research examine the intersection of exposure to climate-induced events, governance processes, and planning mechanisms. As an interdisciplinary scholar, Dr. Shandas studies the emergent characteristics that generate vulnerability among communities and infrastructure. He teaches courses in environmental planning, participatory geographic information systems, and climate adaptation. And he's the founder and director of the Sustaining Urban Places Research Lab. In addition, he chairs Portland's Urban Forestry Commission, and he's a dad. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Dr. Shandas. We look forward to your presentation. Wonderful. Thanks, Noel. Thanks, Nora, for the opportunity to chat with you all um, this evening. Um, I'm glad to be here with um, the Chicago Bulls, with puppies, with uh, faces as well. Lots of um, fun to be in, in audiences that I don't know. And so I'm uh, very curious as to what you think about some of this work um, that I'm going to share with you today. I have um, just a few minutes, so I'm um, going to kind of jump into it uh, relatively swiftly and happy to like spend a good chunk of time in discussion. So as, as I'm kind of pro hopefully provoking you a little bit with some ideas, um, maybe you can um, kind of think about questions or comments, and I'm happy to field them in the chat, and there's some already that's developed on a planning document. Um, and so um, looking forward to that conversation. Before I get into that, though, I, I really am finding it important to recognize that this, this air we breathe, the land we're on, the waters we drink are all part of a connected ecosystem that uh, we share today and that indigenous communities have shared for time immemorial. And these communities um, have been fishing these waters, have been um, climbing these mountains, have been harvesting um, the from the forest for uh, a very long time. And these are tribes known as the uh, Multnomah, the Clackamas, the Clackamas, the Tumwater, what Lala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations that have lived alongside the river known as Wimal, Nietzsche, or Columbia. It's really a privilege to be able to be on this land. And um, from my story, maybe you'll hear a little bit about at least um, this privilege and how I've found a way to try to um, give back here. Um, so I want to just open it up with this idea of localizing climate change. And this is really the phrase I've been using a lot lately is this notion of sweat equity. It really brings together two things that I've been spending a lot of time on over the last decade. And that's um, understanding perspiration, not necessarily um, my own, but the idea of people who sweat a lot during uh, heat events and the fact that they don't have much respite for that. Um, and then the issue of equity. Um, we use this term often when we're working on our homes or trying to like, you know, build financial equity. This is more used in the terms of equitable access to cooling resources. And that's where trees and lots of other um, um, social options uh, come in, in terms of being able to address some of the challenges of climate change locally. Um, before I go any further, I just want to acknowledge today's a new moon. Make a wish, set an intention, light a candle, um, begin something new, go on a date, maybe a first date. Um, this it, it, The powers continue through the week, so you still have some time this weekend to do these things. Um, make a list, create a sacred space, make your own ritual. These are uh, this is the uh, also in my traditional homeland of India. This is the day known as Diwali, which is the beginning of new things, and it lands on the moon. And uh, um, the culture that I was raised in leans into um, the lunar uh, cycle a lot. And so my birthday turns out hops from day to day. It's kind of fun. Each year I get to come up with a new day for my birthday because it's based on that lunar cycle and the star in the sky that falls on that moon day when I was born. So. Wonderful moon, it affects us on a day-to-day -day basis, especially with our tides, um, our bodies, and of course, 
Um, many other ways in which the, the climate is being affected by our solar system that we're in. So wanted to just bring it out to something bigger than the earth before we kind of go down, oops, before we go down deep into our own region and our own place. A um, little bit about me. I grew up here, South India. It's crowded. Lots of people, lots of cars, lots of chickens, cows, dogs, um, monkeys all over the place. And it's a place that I go back and have visited prior to the pandemic regularly as most of my family are there uh, still. And my relatives tell me that now the mangoes don't ripen in March as they always have. They actually ripen in January. So that's a fascinating like lived experience difference that um, is actually detectable in terms of the phenology of plants that are blooming at different times. And we've been able to look at that in the Portland metro region as well. Um, with that, um, my parents moved pretty, um, when I was about 10 years old to this apartment complex or apartment du duplex in um, Santa Rosa, California. And so I, I grew up here for at least those years of my life. And um, I had my earliest experiences, the US, the design, the the layout of the landscape, the, where the trees are, where the cars go, very orchestrated, very discrete spaces that were delineated well before we ever landed here. And I've been trying to um, think about those two landscapes that I've traversed throughout my life on an everyday experience. These two people walking on two sidewalks. These are like two different, completely different places. And these are not by happenstance. These are very carefully uh, created. They're designed to provide specific, um, uh, they're designed to pr provide specific amenities, specific opportunities. Um, and that really plays out in our everyday experiences of the places we inhabit. So I like this to begin in this way in terms of landscapes, because I tend to think about these landscapes as um, socially constructed. These are things that are within our purview, as you all well know, these are, um, this isn't like a jungle where natural selection just kind of plays out in terms of which seeds sprout where. It really is something where we're seeing this as something that we all participate in. And I know, um, you, I know this group is very interested in actions and how to actually move the needle. So these everyday experiences combined with the social construction of landscapes really brings together a call uh, for action in my, in my view. Though before going down the action route too deep, I wanna step back a little bit and just frame up a little bit of what we're talking about here and what I refer to as the climate infrastructure complex, which is really the fact that we've created a set of infrastructure that is burning the planet. And it's that simple to me in terms of how we've gone about harnessing fossil fuels, how we've gone about distributing them, how we've gone about creating uh, machines and various other systems that, um, that increase the likelihood of risk. And that risk is at the center of this IPCC um, uh, framework, which I use a lot to kind of bring together notions of vulnerability. Who's most vulnerable to the climate-induced risks that we're talking about? Who has the greatest level of exposure to those risks? And how do those hazards mediate the likelihood of distribution of vulnerability and exposure? That's all based in something that we call socioeconomics, which I don't want to get into a lot, but that's really about, uh, comes down to what coping capacity do we as a, uh, do I as an individual, do we as a community, do we as a society have, and what are the systems we put in place to um, mediate or potentially ameliorate some of the risks that come from um, an a, a increasingly dysfunctional climate system that is, um, that we're hearing about from the um, COP26 summit happening in Scotland right now that around um, who are facing some of the biggest risks. And if, you paid it, if you've been paying any attention to that, it's really, um, it's really a big question for us of whether the 20 richest countries in the world are going to help the rest of the world. Because the 20 richest countries of which we are a part, if you live in the US, it are massive contributors to the global risk that um, our planet faces. And so really don't want to spend too much time on this, but it frame it provides the framework around which it helps to understand some other issues like the big event that happened this summer of the heat dome event. The modelers, um, this happened, this was a model just a few days before the heat dome, uh, about 10 days before the heat dome descended in the Pacific Northwest. We we're already seeing this massive amount of 
of heat building up around the Midwest and going into this um, California, the south of us. And then that just started amplifying. And we saw that heat dome emerge as a result of this that then kind of swept across the Pacific Northwest, um, killing, uh, almost, killing almost a thousand people in, in just a few days. And so we were well above the pandemic height of the number of people dying as a result of this heat dome for the Pacific Northwest region going from uh, British Columbia down to um, uh, uh, middle of Oregon. Um, there's a really riveting piece about it in the New Yorker this last week. If you had a chance to take a look at it, it was um, very it was very insightful in terms of some of the um, ways in which vulnerability of communities, vulnerability of landscapes was really exposed during this event. Um, as far as models go, this is expected to happen. Uh, the big question remaining after this heat event that you might know or you might think about is whether this was an anomalous event, like, whoa, got through that one, I'm still alive. And unfortunately, a lot of folks died, but that was an anomaly, that was a fluke event. Or if this was some kind of tipping point, some kind of threshold that the planet, that the earth has reached to fundamentally shift the way that meteorology and climate are going to interact. Those are, those are big questions that are still um, kind of lingering and a lot of the climatologists are uh, scratching their heads about this one because not only did it break records, it broke uh, climate models that had been developed over the past three and a half decades. Um, this is what we at least officially know about this heat dome event, that it was that it, uh, heat kills more people than all other natural disasters. And so it's a very um, discriminating silent killer. It killed at least what we know in Oregon, about 96 people. Um, they were mostly over 65. Um, and older, generally older adults comprise the majority of people. They were living in generally older homes. Um, and these were, um, these were generally homes that were multifamily residential, RV parks, mobile home parks, and then single family residential that um, were directly exposed. And so we have, we're starting to get much better at this um, kind of post-mortem diagnostic, if you will. Um, the distribution was super interesting for me because I, I spent a lot of time with maps and trying to think about what happened. And where I see this really playing out is in 2014, we had uh, worked on a project that essentially identified these exact red areas as the places where social vulnerability and um, the built environment were going to accelerate the likelihood of fatality. And that's exactly what we saw play out in this last heat dome event. And this was almost identical to what we saw happen in 20, 1995 in Chicago, when almost a thousand people perished during that extreme heat event. And so 26 years later, we're seeing the same playbook uh, occur with this particular event. So I probably don't need to belabor this a great deal um, because you were all um, probably paying attention to this. And um, I do want to just touch on this, though. There, there, this, I would be remiss if I didn't touch on the fact that there are just really uh, four uh, things that I would want to convey about the, the, the kind of science of heat. Um, and that is, as the earth moves into the, um, I mean, as the sun's rays move into the earth, it hits the ground and it warms the ground. It can also warm the air. It can also warm the water. And a lot of it bounces back off of our atmosphere and the clouds. And so we have, we, we even have ways to quantify the amount of um, the amount of heat and the reflectivity of different surfaces, um, such as ice from, from the sun's rays. So we've been doing this for decades, and we're we're definitely at a stage where we understand at least some of the physical processes at work when it comes to heat. Um, interestingly, as we bring this down to an urban level, meaning in a city like Portland or Gresham or uh, Troutdale or even um, um, other larger places like New York or LA, we start seeing the way the sun's rays are retained and dissipated it, with the built environment really varies quite a bit. And so we've been spending a great deal of time trying to describe that distribution of heat. Um, and one of the things that's come up for, in our work is uh, identifying the fact that um, trees and heat work really close in, in line with one another. Um, it's not a full explanation of what happens, but what we did is we looked at 108 cities, and you might know this work, it's gotten a lot of press, uh, 
But just to recap it briefly, we looked at 108 cities and characterized um, uh, four different neighborhood types in these cities. Um, this was um, neighborhood types that were delineated in the 1930s. And these 1930s neighborhoods were essentially graded on a um, spectrum of risk as the Homeowners Loan Corporation and the uh, Federal Housing Authority put this together and basically came up with a description that said areas that were green lined were considered, quote, the best. Areas that were uh, red lined were considered hazardous. And this was infamously known as the red lining policies of the 1930s that went all the way up to the mid 1960s and stopped at the Fair Housing Act. But what that early, what that policy did in the 1930s is they were essentially able to uh, codify into local planning law, whether a um, person of color, whether a low income person, whether an immigrant could buy homes, could move into specific neighborhoods of a city. You might be scratching your head if you haven't seen this and wondering why would anything about a mortgage backed risk assessment have anything to do with climate? Um, turns out when we looked at those 108 cities that the amount of tree canopy as well as the amount of heat varied proportionally in relation to whether you lived in a green lined neighborhood or a red line neighborhood. And we saw that the amount of tree canopy that's here in Portland, for example, varied if, you, if it was designated as a quote, um, best neighborhood in the 1930s, or if it was designated as a hazardous neighborhood in the 1930s. And that played out regardless of whether you were in the Midwest, Northeast, West, or South. We saw these box and whisker plots, as we call them, essentially show that the amount of tree canopy is much more in the green areas and much less in the red areas. So we have this kind of issue of heat and trees baked into the landscape on which many of us uh, currently reside. And that really uh, plays out as we speculated in, in a paper that we published last year that um, is, is about the fact that we have a set of um, policies that came after and uh, during these, after these redlining policies where if you wanted in 1950s, if the Federal Highway Administration was putting down a highway, that highway went to the most land, uh, went to areas that were the least cost. And by design, areas that were disinvested in, meaning these yellow and red areas that were disinvested in, that didn't get um, uh, mortgages that people were renting or they didn't get parks, lots of other services that weren't put into these green, uh, yellow or red line neighborhoods, they ended up getting the highways, they ended up getting the big box stores, they ended up getting the facilities. And so these areas that were, or these land uses that were very land hungry, went to the lowest rent, lowest land rent areas. And today we're able to see that signature through temperature. And that temperature really played out in terms of um, uh, differences that we saw. And I'll talk about this in terms of Portland in a minute. This is at the national average, these homeowner loan corporation security ratings of A, B, C, and D will show that tree canopy really follows a lot of the patterns that we've seen playing out in um, since um, you know, almost a hundred years ago from, from today, we're still seeing the same patterns. In Portland, if you take it a little more locally, we looked at this and these are the redlined areas, the, um, oops, I wanna bring this, this up too. These are the redlined areas, the blue lined area or the green lined areas in Portland. And you might see, for example, uh, your neighborhood, if you don't live in the city, this was still present in the suburbs. They were done through racial covenants and other exclusionary zoning practices that existed in, in urban areas throughout the country. We have really good documentation for Portland around which areas were deemed best, still desirable, definitely declining and hazardous. Um, it was really interesting that this really plays out with income today and that we've also seen related directly to tree canopy and the patterns of income and tree canopy people have been talking about for a long time. In other words, places that have more uh, trees, which is marked by this little green a cylindrical circle, the bigger the circle, the more the trees in this area. I know it's late at night and it's probably, I'm probably going too fast, but I really am trying to kind of um, convey really a basic point is, and that is uh, 
that the income and the tree canopy follow the maps that were des designated in the 1930s. And that was something that prior to this paper, no one had touched that piece, which then ties right into where the hottest areas are. And when we looked across the country, the hottest place of all 108 cities that we looked at was Portland, Oregon, with a difference of 13 degrees Fahrenheit between the red-lined areas and the green-lined areas in the city. And that really caught me by surprise because I was thinking it would be much more on the order of, you know, Jackson, Mississippi, or Baltimore, or Chicago, places I'd heard about redlining a lot, not, not, our, not our own Portland, Oregon, but it definitely made headline news uh, after this. And I just saw, actually, I was told last night, uh, Noah, Tre uh, Trevor Noah's The Daily Show, if, you, if you're watching that at all, they had a whole bit on this paper. I had no idea, but they took this paper that we did and essentially um, did a whole segment on The Daily Show around this particular issue, which was um, in many ways enlightening because the way they did it was a very funny, like tongue in cheek type of a, a presentation. If you have a chance, check that out. Um, so moving to today, um, we wanted to look at what's happening in these spaces today, these A, B, C, and D spaces, and what are the opportunities for getting green space into these places? And when you look at Oakland, for example, where this is a, um, a percentage uh, going up and down here. So instead of 0.3, think about it as 30%, 30%, 20%, 10%, 0%. 0%. And the amount of population change in these different areas seems to be tracking the same pattern that we saw. So developments and developers seem to be really honing in on the C and D neighborhoods as the most developable parts of the city for multifamily residential and large projects. And so what we're seeing in terms of our, our um, in terms of Oakland is the same pattern or a similar pattern we're seeing in Los Angeles, similar pattern we're seeing in Berkeley, similar pattern we're seeing in Sacramento, and the similar pattern we're seeing in Portland right, where the C neighborhoods are getting a lot of that uh, population growth um, from the, for the last 40 years, and while the uh, B neighborhoods, surprisingly A neighborhoods in Portland saw a lot more than the, their other West Coast counterparts, which is a super interesting pattern that we're, thinking, that we're digging into a bit more. So what this means is that as we begin with less tree canopy and we have greater development pressure on areas that are historically disinvested, getting trees into the ground, into these areas that were, um, that are, that were designated as, as uh, hazardous or definitely declining is now an ever more challenging action to take. And this is where it gets into some really challenging discussion about how do we actually center these areas in our work, these C and D or historically disinvested areas, when there's so much development pressure there and there's so much historical challenge in terms of even getting a tree into the ground. That's the work in front of us for thinking about heat and trees um, in this field. I, I'm gonna just maybe close out with just a quick little study that we did that's looking at a part of East Portland um, uh, where there's a large lot neighborhood um, Northeast 58th, and we're the city's pushing to up zone. So go from 16 units in this. This is very real kind of a, a, a place, 16 units upping it to 64 units. And the idea here is to say, well, can we get density and maintain temperatures in those locations? So we ran essentially a model, a computer model. Um, because doing this in real life would take many, many years to do and lots of complexities. So we ran a computer model, which is a accepted, at least um, in a peer-reviewed setting, it's an accepted uh, way of looking at the climate variation that, or the temperature variation that happens locally. And so we looked at um, seven different scenarios. So let me just go through these with you. We looked at uh, the base case, and then we took 64 units and just distributed them very differently across the landscape. We looked at it as, you know, the gray areas are the actual units and the green areas are green space. And we kind of varied the green space and the building um, configuration in different ways across each of these scenarios. And plan 6B in the upper right is our 
quintessential multifamily residential development where you have um, two to three floors of, of, of building with a parking lot in the middle and the roads on the side. It's like a heat trap. We see those going up. We've, we still see those. Those have been going in since the 1940s. They're still being developed all around the country and including here in town. Plan 6S, though, we decided to lighten the roofs, put in a bunch of green space in the middle, as well as uh, lighten the roads outside, the public roads, lightening those outside of the development because the lighter colors will reflect back some of the heat. And what we found was that in the 6B example, temperatures generally went up by about three degrees Celsius. It's about seven degrees Fahrenheit on average with that development from the current development as opposed to the plan 6S that actually was able to reduce temperatures overall in that site. So, so I guess the bottom line here is that we can in fact increase density while maintaining pre-development temperatures. And that was a big aha moment for us because we were just kind of throwing up our hands and saying, well, what are you gonna do with density if that's the big push when it comes to heat? And we were able to get to a point where we were um, showing designs that could actually work from a density point of view. We've done the same thing in Washington, DC and Richmond, Columbia and Seattle, Washington and Los Angeles. And we're, we're kind of exploring, these are just, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but these are just ways to take, for example, a public housing project and think about how do we cool that environment because a lot of communities face just disproportionate exposure to heat, as I was just saying, in many of these projects, in many of these multifamily residential projects. And we're showing how through the installation of green infrastructure on the roofs, on the walls, as well as around the building, we could blunt that extreme kind of heightened temperature in the middle of the day. Um, that's essentially what these graphs are getting at. Happy to get into it more. Just a couple of last projects um, in, in Los Angeles, we're working with the city and county and a bunch of nonprofits there. We're, we're coming up with this idea of how do you green a neighborhood that has not had green before? And so we're coming up with, we've come up with this plant priority model where there are essentially three tiers. The first one is the easy wins. Um, those are places where you usually have space, you dig a hole, enough soil volume, you get trees in, not a hard sell for most municipal planners, for most decision makers. Uh, tier two is a bit more difficult, more moderate in terms of getting a tree into the ground. You may have to tear up some concrete. You may actually have to change some policies. You may have to kind of work with local communities in that uh, uh, space to, to um, get a tree into the ground. So a little bit more work. And then the tier three are usually more expensive, um, though end up seeing a lot more green as well. These are things like diverters or plazas, bus, bus bulbs, chicanes. There's a lot of different strategies there, but often requiring some fundamental shifts in the physical infrastructure itself. And that's where things like the pedestrian design guidelines, various other uh, policies that are being considered right now really come into play because those could really uh, move us into a tier three and integrating uh, more green spaces into redesigns of neighborhoods that are that are underway, including, for example, on division uh, 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 east east southeast division, big project like big push for a lot of us was trying to figure out how do you keep the trees in the ground that are already there, and then how do you bring more trees when there's a new kind of design being put into the ground. So that's that's some of the work in LA. Here's some of the graphics that have come out of that project where we're, oops, where we're actually trying to get a neighborhood in real, I mean, this is a concrete jungle. And I always say, if, I can, if we can do this in LA, we can do this anywhere. And we're kind of doing this in LA. Um, and it helps that we have a lot of great constellation lineup of people that are in place. So we're thinking about the little surgical interventions that we can identify street by street. And we've done this in a bunch of uh, south, southeast, uh, south central LA neighborhoods. We've done this in neighborhoods that the local communities have said really need a, a, an additional um, opportunity for green green space. Um, the last thing I'll point to is just something I'm watching carefully is this whole Paris Schoolyard Oasis project. It's called Paris Oasis generally, but um, generally the schoolyard, since this is a family's event, um, part of what we're uh, part of what I'm seeing emerge here is an extraordinary set of um, resources as well as design options and other uh, features that are being considered in, in 
uh, schoolyards throughout the massive metropolis that LA is. And so there's a real push to try to green, uh, green the schoolyards to, uh, uh, you know, and it hasn't, it may seem obvious enough to many of us in Portland to think about vegetable gardens and schoolyards or, or um, installation, re-veg uh, shade houses and schoolyards. But for a place like Paris, it's, it's really uh, pretty revolutionary um, to be moving in this direction because it's virtually sealed up most of, most of Paris. And so these, these kind of interventions are starting to make their way. It's getting a lot, of, lot more attention recently. I think there's a book that'll be coming out focusing exclusively on the Paris Oasis project that is really making some, making some headway. Um, so with that, I leave you with this, you know, the, the thing we're trying to do is really evaluate social vulnerability. We're thinking about things like grid stability in this work, like what are places you can um, intervene because when a big heat wave comes through, PGE folks that I talk to and Pacific Power folks I talk to, they're saying that we really escaped narrowly with this last heat wave because most of our infrastructure, electricity infrastructure is not well set up for the kind of event that we just experienced. And so what kind of questions can we pose in terms of energy distribution? Um, a lot of community awareness discussions I'm, I'm seeing emerge right now, mainly through community-based organizations like yours. Um, the, the green space question is coming up a lot. Um, for sure, it is a, a very cost-effective and relatively easy, arguably easy way politically as well to get, get some cooling into neighborhoods. Um, and then of course, the built environment example I was showing earlier. And finally, housing policy. Oh, housing policy. Something that is not an easy conversation, but I will just, I will just end with this. We're just kicking off a project where we're working with Home Forward, the Housing Authority of Portland, Home Forward, to um, install a series of sensors in several different buildings um, to be able to kind of get ahead of some of the deaths that are happening, that, have, that happened as a result of this heat wave. So there might, so there is a way to look at both air quality and heat within buildings where people who might be particularly vulnerable are living. And um, just like we have carbon monoxide or, or smoke detectors in our homes, a heat detector and air quality detector are other things that we're really starting to move forward on. And we have a couple of pilot projects that I'm hoping to kick off in 2022 to kind of um, explore that. And it's something I know the rest of the country would be really curious about how that work is playing out as they're all, um, they're all not, uh, Portland's not unique in that context. A lot of other places are experiencing very similar uh, challenges. So with that, I'll just close out, leave my contact info here. Uh, Noel, I'm sorry, I think I went about five minutes long. Apologize for that. Hope we, I'm happy to stick around.